This episode of the Inner Ho Uprising is also available for your viewing pleasures on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. If you're looking at people, if looking at people while they're podcasting is your thing, then you can click the YouTube link in our show notes and gaze along as we talk our shit. Also, this episode of the Inner Ho Uprising is sponsored by you. That's right you. All of your Patreon donations, PayPal donations, five-star reviews on Apple and Stitcher, shout-outs on social media, articles, mentions to your friends, IHU merchandise purchases. This is too much. All make this show possible week in and week out. And for that, we thank you, homies. You do so much for us. You love us. Uh, (laughs) Welcome to the Inner Ho Uprising, the podcast about sex, love, and dating from the perspective of me, Sam, one black, non-monogamous, pansexual, feminist hoe who lives in New York City, whose pronouns are she and her, and who is social distancing. And we love to see it because you need to fucking do it. And me, Rob, one pansexual, agender, feminist with a fatty who pronouns are they, them, and fire fatty. Mm, Is that because you play in fire? That is because I'm a firefighter. <laughs> Letting people know. Fire daddy. Niggas is fire. You, that you fire play? Zuko? Oh, we took that uh, two different directions. Uh, yeah, I, you lost me. I lost you. Oh, you never I saw lost. Avatar? Uh-oh. Oh, oh God. Mm-hmm. I'm about to get beat up. <laughs> They're going to kill me, man. It's on Netflix now. You should watch. Uh, <laughs> Damn. Anyway, uh, every episode of the Inner Heart Uprising works like this. Myself and my lovely rotating co-hosts talk about sex, love, and dating as it pertains to current events in the world, our lives, and yours. And sometimes we go on deep dives into particular topics like we do in this here episode. Today we're talking about romance and love addiction. And occasionally we hit you with interviews from insightful folks. To go a little bit more into today's episode, we are talking about romance addictions. Do you have one? What is the science behind that bullshit? shit and how to deal with it plus we're going to do a review of the new netflix film that puts white heteronormative rom-coms to shame healing from trauma whilst understanding hypersexuality and the cutest black feminist virtual date in the history of all virtual dates it was very cute all right (laughs) if you would like to follow along with the conversation had in this podcast on social media you can do so by using the hashtag in a whole uprising so we can see it and the hashtag pod in so other people could see it if you would like to follow us on social media, you can do so at In A Whole Uprising without the G on Twitter, In A Whole Uprising on Instagram and Facebook. You can join our Facebook group by searching In A Whole Uprising Community, that's C-U-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y. And you can head to InAWholeUprising.com to sign up for weekly goodies via our newsletter, Pay A Whole, or check out merch. And if you're freaking with the vision, this is for all YouTubers, if you're freaking with the vision and down with the vibes, do us a favor and hit subscribe. I'm going to keep going, though. If you're supportive of the hoes and want to see our success spike, do us a favor and click like. Time for the one time. If you want to keep the conversation going during your time spent, do us a last favor and go on and comment. Thank you, Rob. Damn, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) I'm doing spoken word in my free time these days. Oh, that's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. Uh, And if you want to pay us to speak virtually at your school or conference about sex positivity, black feminism, podcasting, spoken word, or the other kinds of topics that we discuss on this here show, or host a consent, pleasure, or dating virtual workshop for your organization, what? Or if you would like us to host a consent, pleasure, or dating virtual workshop for your organization, we would love to do that as well. So to book us, you can send us line to ihupodcast at gmail.com. We're going to start it up with a little segment that we like to call Ho of the Week. Ho of the Week is where we shout out the homies who have supported IHU in the past week. Hoes of the Week get special nicknames, and the game, if they choose to participate, is to guess the meaning behind the nicknames. So this week, we got Don Trey. H, a.k.a. Montre, who became a patron. And, oh, man, it's such a silly reason, Montre. I hope, I hope, I hope you try. Because <laughs> I, I don't get it, and I really want to know, and I can't wait for <laughs> us to stop recording so I could find out. Anyway, um, shout out to Charmizzy, whose real name is Charmaine, who upped their pledge on Patreon. How, shout out you. to GL, a.k.a. Get Light. Patron. get your light feet going the Ooh. light the light 
<laughs> yeah, I really like that one. Uh, shout out to Ariana S, aka Ariana Randy, who became a patron. Shout out to Nikita M, aka La Fan Nikita, who paid us on PayPal and left us a lovely note. Shout out to Kojo, aka Conathan Co-Star, <laughs> who left a really nice Apple Podcast review. And shout out to Roxanne, aka Roxanne's Revenge, who also left a very nice and insightful podcast review on Apple. Rob, you really liked uh, Comet and Co-Star. I'm a fucking nerd. <laughs> it just sounds so, it's so beautiful. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to be a hoe that we can get a cool nickname, here are some things that you can do. You can leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. You can shout us out in an article you've written or you can shout us out on social media. These are some non-monetary ways you can support us. We love monetary and non-monetary support, and we understand that in these uncertain times, mon monetary support is not feasible for many folks, so please do not spend your bottom dollar on us. But if you can spare some change, you can donate to us on PayPal at pay PayPal. You can donate to us on PayPal at paypal.me slash innerho. You can become a patron on Patreon at patreon.com slash innerho uprising, or you can purchase some merchandise at innerhouprising.com slash merchandise. The links to which the links to which are in the show notes. I love that YouTubers can see what the real show is, which is just us fucking up. Oh the <laughs> It's just like your mouth will say something and be like, why did you say that? The you links see, I, to which you'd be like skipping over little words. <laughs> And then going back to the, man, podcasting ain't easy, <laughs> exactly. but we do it. Oh man, that we do. Uh, also a reminder that if you become a patron on Patreon for $2 a month, you can participate in things like our Slack chat, our patron only film nights, and for $5 a month, you can join our Monday night Zoom hangouts. We got some events coming up. Yes, we do. I think you should come virtually and then nah. come in your genitals. What? what? Anyway. <laughs> In your genitals. <laughs> that sounds so fucked up. Now that's what I call backed up. Oh my God. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Wow. Ugh, anyway. Ah. The 200th episode party. Your fave hoes, your fave hoes are soon approaching 200 episodes in the books. And to celebrate, we're throwing a Zoom party open to all of our patrons to kick it, reminisce on old episodes, laugh, dance, sing, whatever, have a good time with us. The hangout will be Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020 at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's the night that our 200th episode drops. And we'll post a link to the Zoom hangout a few days prior to the event on Patreon. We hope that you can all come and celebrate with us. What are you looking forward to for the 200th episode, Rob? I'm looking forward to just looking back on um, how much we've grown. We've grown so fucking much. That's very true. Even just like, not just like the things that we say and we talk about, just like our own personal selves. We've evolved into some fucking amazing people. Not that we weren't amazing before, but I mean, fuck. Amazing-er is the word. Yeah. <laughs> Bitch, more amazing is actually the word, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that also. I'm very... Uh, very proud so honestly i'm looking forward to just like reveling in a mutual accomplishment and drinking some wine maybe i'll make margaritas maybe i'll make moscow yeah. meals okay wow honestly we should do we should all get uh jose cuervo and this will oh. be our fake oh we can do it together like a like a um a, a drink thing but we yeah. all separate oh my exactly I, this social this isn't shit is fucking me up that, it's sad but it's, it's but that sounds lit yeah Damn, I, I don't know if I want to be drunk on with a, with all these people, but <laughs> YOLO, nigga. I'll just mute your uh your camera. I'll you know like, what? We should a little wild. We should record the um episode drunk too. We've never done okay. that before. Yes, we have. <laughs> just not kidding. that oh. drunk. Not that well, drunk. We won't Drinking. be we won't be smizzed, but let's 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 pregame. Let's be drizz. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. It was fine. It was fine. Shout out to Young May. Anyway, uh, so there's that. You can celebrate that with us. Also, coming up, we have Akua's solo sex workshop. Has social distancing and self isolation placed your partnered sex life in a momentorium? 
Are you interested in discovering alternate ways to experience pleasure and maintain a healthy sex life during these trying times? Well, this Friday, you can join our favorite mental health therapist, Bald Batty Akua, for a patrons-only Zoom workshop about masturbation. Wonders. The workshop will cover the basics of solo sex from start to finish, including ideas for solo foreplay and tips and techniques to rock your world. That will be on Zoom as well on Friday, May 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll post a link to the Zoom session on our Patreon uh, the Thursday before the workshop. Also, shout out to the non-patrons. Like those were two events for patrons, but we want the non-patrons to sit tight and keep in mind that we'll be doing all kinds of virtual events, all kinds of virtual events open to the public for as long as the pandemic lasts. And we want you to stay tuned for more because we'll be announcing those on the show and our social medias. One last shout out before we get into this real juicy topic that job, that Rob, I was going to call you job. I am job. This is job. This nigga has mad jobs, so their name mad is just job. job. <laughs> Rob jobs. <laughs> uh, this real juicy topic that Rob is going to get into, but I want you all to know that Akua, the aforementioned co-host, was recently featured on our friends over at the Miss Vixen podcast. Miss Vic Miss Vixen is your destination for lit womanist perspectives on pop culture, politics, media, and other incisive conversation usually stolen from us from the mainstream to profit off of. Akua and Miss. Vi <laughs> Sorry, I thought I wrote something wrong. Akua and Miss Vixen host Queen spoke all about sex therapy and raising sex therapy and raising a sex positive child. And the link to that episode will be in the show notes. Now, without further ado, we're going to get into a little segment that we like to call Fuck It. It is our topic of the day. And Rob is going to tell us about mine as well. Face it, you're addicted to love which is what I wanted to name the episode. And then Rob was like, no. And I was like, joke's on you because I'm still going to name it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can do the segment, but I'm going to name it. Yeah, what you fuck do what you want, Sam. It don't what's hurt. Go what's going on? So I'll be talking about romance and love addiction. So what inspired this episode was um, my best friend, right? We are having a very serious WhatsApp conversation because, you know, you can't see niggas now. And he asked me, do you think that you're addicted to sex? And I'm like, nah, I went months without sex um, and I wasn't like furiously masturbating. I don't think that that qualifies for a sexual addiction. And he's like, well, what about romance and love? And I was like, is that possible? You got me there. <laughs> I never like uh, heard of it. I never heard of that, like a, rom a romance addiction, a love addiction, like being addicted to a, a feeling. Um, so I wanted to actually research it and see if there was real scientific basis for it. And also enlighten everybody that it's actually a thing that does exist. And it's actually a thing that you can, you know, cope with, treat deep dive into with your therapist or whatever mm. so that's why we're here that's important. so i'll be going yeah it mean like imagine going your whole life doing the same thing over and over and over again not knowing what the fuck you're doing and then you're 50 60 and find out that you're just addicted to romance and you're like damn now i only got 30 years left <laughs> Oh boy, we didn't have to. The fifty-year-old listeners are like, "Wow, fuck you," because I was banking on another fifty. I said sixty, fifty and sixty. So how about thirty or forty or fifty or ninety? I mean, it's, it's twenty twenty. It's more just happening. You never fucking know. So romance and love addictions may look different for everybody. Like you may not be looking for um, a serious relationship but like casual partners who make you feel romance. Like when you were dating initially, like you like, Oh, I don't want to be in a serious relationship, but I do want people to date and to mm -hmm. have fun with, mm -hmm. you know, without, without that uh, monogamy experience. Um, it's healthy to do either. There's nothing wrong with either of those things. And for millennia, our ancestors have been doing the same, keeping our species alive and thriving and 
yeah, there's nothing like wrong with like dating and wanting to love, longing for love, but it is unhealthy and it may be addictive when it consumes your life. And a breakup is often followed by like intense feelings of rage, anxiety, and depression. Mm. Which break that ha- does happen when you have any kind yeah, of yeah. I'm Every curious week. about intense. Like it seems like emphasis is on the intense there. Yes, but we'll get into that. Okay. Um, because there's there's. There's levels to this shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> Interesting. So from the article, Intense, Passionate, Romantic Love, A Natural Addiction, How the Fields Investigate Romance and Substance Abuse Can Inform in- Each Other. It's a study on romantic addiction. And seriously, it's a really, really good read. It's an easy read, too, as far as studies go. So you should what definitely journal get into it? it. Or how did you oh, access it? Uh, Google Scholars. Nice. Since I don't have access to anything else. Yeah, I was um, like, niggas got a JSTOR up in here? I what was that other like, one called? Abisco or something? Yeah, it was JSTOR, Abisco. There was there was a lot of them. Yeah. But I still have access to that from Hunter. But Oh, then I probably do as well. Yeah, you probably do. I don't think you lose access. Or you can just sign up as an alumni. But anyway, point. Oh, yeah, you can't do that. That's true. Um, but I just went on Google Scholar hoping that an article was free because Google Scholar be fucking giving you like when a tidbit. When you're poor and a nerd. <laughs> it's like, I just want to learn. I just want to learn. But this one happened to be free. So um, here's some tidbits from that. The authors propose that romantic love is a natural addiction that evolved from some of our mammalian ancestors. Romantic love may have started as far back as 4.4 million years ago. Wow, it's a fucking long time. It's a long like, time to be loving niggas. Like, Was there anything oh worth God. loving back then? Bro? No, that wasn't until niggas came along. Imagine, like, you um, get cheated on after a long day of gathering nuts. <laughs> like, I'm tired, and then you cheated on me, bro? Can nah. you stop? <laughs> Right. Niggas are gathering nuts because we're fucking <laughs> squirrels. Like niggas was not eating you know, mad raw meat, but okay. <laughs> no, before the meat days when it was just like mad fucking gathering before the hunting. Well, before the hunting and gathering was before hominins. So those are just our like what you would call like monkey like ancestors, mm-hmm. and they weren't necessarily monogamous. I see. Um, but our hominin ancestors, which are the closest you get to humans before humans, mm-hmm. um, they were, I mean, I wouldn't say monogamous. Like, how the fuck are you going to know if they're monogamous or not? <laughs> but um, research suggests that two partners became attached and it allowed them to focus their mating time on each other and rear young together, as opposed to one male partner, like, having sex with tons of women and then them rearing the young by themselves Mm -hmm. which happens a lot with other animals Mm -hmm. um and romantic love for that reason could be considered a part of evolution because you're bonded to that person for life um but lovers with an addiction they may relapse like drug addicts do Long after the relationship is over, specific cues like people places or events songs that are associated with a past lover may trigger memories. This initiates the renewed craving, obsessive thinking, which leads to compulsive texting or phone calls or showing up in hopes that the romance would be rekindled despite the likely negative consequences and renewed rejection. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, the intense feelings come along. Um, But even then, that still might happen in a normal breakup but it's the constant cycle of it that becomes unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah. When you say long after, what is long after? Um, Well, they didn't give a specific time, but if I can speak from experience, um, for me, I would have those feelings for maybe up to a year, year and a half. Um, of like having a cue and that cue still reminding me of that person so much that I'm like texting my friends like Mm. tell me not to call this nigga because I'm about Mm. to call this nigga you know so that also has to do with uh how long the relationship was too so like if you only dated someone for a month and a year later you're like (sighs) yeah sign of like okay like od 
if you date somebody for six months, which isn't even out of like the honeymoon stage and you have those intense extreme feelings, like that may indicate that there might be something different going on. I see. Okay. Um, but a lot of behaviors that romance addicts experience with the current partner are truly compulsive, such as compulsively following your partner, incessantly calling or texting. By incessantly, I mean like nonstop. Um, or it's unexpectedly appearing at like their workplace or appearing at a function that they're at. Uh, this is an effort to be with their beloved one day, I mean, day and night, even if it's not physical. So even if I can't physically be with you, I'm going to text you because I want to know where you are. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know who you with. And you got to always remember it. At a certain point, it's not that bad. In the beginning, except like randomly showing up and shit, but also it depends on who your partner is and what they are comfortable with. That might not be like the worst thing for them because that personally wasn't the worst thing for me, but it's when it's a problem for you and your partner. Like you are calling me too much. You are texting me too much. When That's you're breaking when you, boundaries. Exactly. And then the relationship falls apart. Mm. Um, also sounds like a stalker ish behavior yes it is stalker ish Mm -hmm. because i mean i don't i can't say much about stalkers in general besides what like i know from just media in general Mm -hmm. but a lot of it seems to just want to know what that person is doing at all times even if you don't want to like talk to them or interact with them just knowing what they're doing is satisfying enough Mm -hmm. um so neurotransmitters my favorite um so dopamine along with oxytocin adrenaline serotonin all these tonins and lins that we talk about a lot on the show um and various endorphins play a vital role in ignoring red flags in the hopes to find a partner Mm. um this neurochemical reaction it matches the same reactions found in those who abuse drugs or have a sexual addiction Um, So it would not be improper to say that new romance can be just as addictive as sex or cocaine Mm, mm -hmm. because it basically lights up in CAT scans and MRIs. Is it MRIs? MRIs, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Those same regions constantly light up when you have um, a new love. Yeah, Yeah, but also you just sniff some good ass coke. (laughs) Not that I would know what that's like. Um, (laughs) So things that are bothersome to you, like will typically like piss you off, they're ignored because this person seems like this endless book that you just want to keep reading. Yeah. Tell me not. And you like, seriously, tell me not. Oh, yeah. That's why I said yeah so affirmatively. (laughs) <laughs> that wasn't like a uh-huh, uh-huh that was like a no yeah yeah because you know you be ignoring that shit and like you know when you're done don't you see like the red flags that you saw in the very beginning were ultimately the reason why you guys didn't really work out mm-hmm. but you're like but I ignored them I could have avoided this whole thing mm-hmm. if I would have just said that that was not okay or whatever that bothered me too much mm-hmm. but you know there's levels the brain do be braining, though. The brain do be fucking braining, and you can't really help what the brain be doing. Um, I've scrolled too far down. I'm so fucking thirsty. Oh, my God. Swallowing my spit like water. Um, so love and romance addicts are not necessarily hooked on love and romance. It's mm-hmm. not, because love and romance are not tangible things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's the limerent stage. So you introduced Limerence in season five, episode 39, Hot I Human did. Summer, yes. when we were all like, what the fuck is Limerence? That episode changed lives. It did. A lot of people's, including mine. But the thing is, this is the first time that I've seen Limerence mentioned in a, um, a study. Mm-hmm. I've never seen that word in a study. So I'm like, oh, niggas is like really getting hip to this shit now. Mm-hmm. Um, but is the study you, published? If you know. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> um, girl, you, you know, I was just, I was just making this shit happen. <laughs> um, but if you go it. click the link, yes, um, let me know. Um, 2016. Oh, so that's not, that's a pretty recent study. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure limerence, that word might have been used, but niggas just didn't 
catch on to it. Yeah, I don't know uh, when it was introduced in a scientific concept, but I mean, it's existed in English yes. for a while. And it's um, an actual thing that does happen, even mm-hmm. if it didn't have a word. Can you re-explain what that is for people who did not listen to episode? Mega, of course 39. I can. <laughs> Limerence is the neurochemical rush of new romances. So limerence can be a catalyst to a long-term healthy relationship because it's so brief, brief, brief. (laughs) Um, And it could lead to forming strong bonds. However, those afflicted with addiction try to prolong the stage, try to get back the original early excitement. Mm. So once I dated this woman whose mother was addicted to crack, they were actually in the same prison. It was a very odd time. Mm. Um, and she asked her mother, like, why? Like, why do you keep doing crack? Like, you get sober, you get out of jail, and then you go back, you do the same thing, you end up back in jail. Why do you keep doing that? And her response was always that she was ch- chasing her first high. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that is, like, the key characteristic of the limerent stage because that is the first high when you are infatuated with each other when all you want to do is be around each other and talk to each other but that's something that fades and it's okay to fade and it always does can you hear that no what is it is it the the clapping oh i forgot it's seven o'clock i feel like i should i should pause it because it's really loud in my background and i don't want to come on the recording you could you let it did you pause it I didn't pause it. Just let, let it, it run. For five yeah, minutes. let it run. But we'll just. So we can just talk that. to these YouTube niggas. Like, eh, 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 eh. how do YouTube niggas feel about the claps? <laughs> that the is claps. the seven p.m. clapping for uh, essential workers. Yes. Okay. Um, or is it just medical professionals? No, it's just. I think it's essential workers, frontline workers. Oh, um, man, the fact that it's all essential workers and people are so terrible—that just pisses me off. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like if y'all are clapping y'all better be tipping niggas like you just need That's to be doing thing. all of the things yo i had I otherwise just put i'm up angry this tweet where you know like that uh video where the guy's like cooking with like nothing <laughs> <laughs> i've seen certain things yeah i've seen yeah like so I, I put that one up and the the caption said um what the seven like what the, all your claps and applause <laughs> gives essential workers like absolutely fucking nothing that's the food oh, i thought that's what you ate rob you don't eat claps? I don't. I don't. And pots and pans. And pots and pans. I am a pansexual, but I don't eat pans. It just doesn't, it's just, you know, it just, um, I, I can't, I can't front. Like, as I said, like, at first, like, after my first fucked up tour, I didn't say as I said, because you guys didn't hear that, unless you do listen to uh, Sam's interview with me about yeah, frontline workers. Yeah, we did an oral history a couple of weeks ago, yeah. But... The first time I had my first fucked up shift where I came home and I was like, what am I doing? And then I heard those seven o'clock claps and I was like, oh, people actually like appreciate this shit. But two months later. <laughs> Weird. Whatever. We got one more minute because they'd be, they literally clap until 7.05. The fact that it happens for, this is very funny to me. So YouTubers, this is the second time that I'm experiencing this with Rob on Zoom specifically. Um, and yeah, the preciseness of it is very funny to me. Like that is, these niggas are It's hilarious. Um, it's like a little bit of pots and pans, but I think it, I think it should be okay. Okay. All right. Ignore any pots and pans you might hear in the background. That is the 7 p.m. claps that happen for essential workers here in America, the place where half the country doesn't believe the virus exists. Anyway, oh my God, um, this, this, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, what were we <laughs> <laughs> So to, to Limerence. Yes. Um, damn. But I think I, I think I finished the, the whole thing over limerence. Uh-huh. That if I didn't, essentially, yes. It's just, you're trying to go back to that initial stage that naturally does fade away. Like, no yes. couple remains. In, and limerence is, like, synonymous with the honeymoon stage. Mm-hmm. And that's um, from one to six to eight months. Um, the cupcake phase. And it's, like, a lot of couples, if they really find out they're not vibing with each other, they break up within that that time frame and then some couples make it past and they still break up but either way it's like the honeymoon stage is that beginning 
rush of all of these neuro, these chemicals that you know you can't stop it like you can stop it but it would be changing the way that you think completely um but it's okay like limerence feels good as fuck it does but that's the thing it feels so good that it can be addictive that Mm -hmm. you want to feel it over and over again or you want to prolong it for as long as you possibly can and Mm -hmm. you might prolong it for yourself but you might not be prolonging it for your partner Mm -hmm. um so with diagnosis so the dsm-5 which is the latest dsm uh that is the diagnostic manual something manual wow i have a fucking degree in psychology and i forgot what dsm stands for but that's fine it's a book used to diagnose mental yes mental um yes um anything mental illness wise Mm -hmm. um and it has seven oh seven how is that whatever it has 11 criteria for substance abuse where only two must be present for a diagnosis so the website rehabs.com it actually just focused on three indicators and it seemed like they just kind of inserted the word like love and romance in lieu of substances and it works just fine so um one diagnosis one criteria rather uh was for six months or more love addicts are preoccupied to the point of obsession with new relationships ongoing relations romantic fantasies of the like uh, the other one is love addicts have lost control over their romantic fantasies and relationships. More often, this loss of control is evidenced by failed attempts to quit or at least curtail their obsessive search for love. And lastly, love addicts, like other addicts, experience the negative life consequences that are directly and indirectly related to their obsessive behavior. Mm. Um, so romance addicts, they struggle to find or rom romaine oh god <laughs> romaine it's, actually, lettuce. it's actually a guy i was in love with in uh seventh grade because he smelled so good and he didn't smell that good when i was 16 but <laughs> <laughs> romance addicts struggle to find or maintain romantic and sexual intensity and once the intensity fades they search for a new re- they search for a new relationship let me mm. make sure i'm talking into this microphone because i'm moving up a lot um, they rely on these kinds of relationships to escape stress, mental illness, or unresolved trauma, mm-hmm. which are the things that people use alcohol, drugs, and sex for. Mm-hmm. And they can feel alone when not engaged in relationships, but when they are in one, they may feel smothered. So it's a very conflicting cycle. Why is it that they feel smothered when they are in one? I think it's because they don't really want to be in one. Oh. It's more of the, the rush of chemicals, but then if you are in a relationship then you're expected to also do relationship things ah smothered by the responsibilities <laughs> of being in a relationship and not just the yes. funness yes the okay. funness the fun the funness goes away after a fucking while it really does that shit is yeah. work relationships always work mm-hmm. um and they can confuse romantic and sexual intensity with long-term or true emotional intimacy mm. so an example of that would be somebody that you had sex with you may have had like a really good time you may have felt like a really personal connection and they felt it was still kind of casual but you treat it as oh you must really fucking like me and you begin to try to you maneuver your way into their life so you're a more consistent partner and they're not with the shits that happens a lot when um i get ghosted say more um so recently, there was a guy who, yeah, I was breaking social distances. I'm a stupid ass bitch. But um, he came over. I brought him dinner. We watched, he helped me dye my hair. Um, we had like such like intimate moments that my grandmother died. So he's like, oh, anything you need help with, like I'll help you. I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. Um, eventually, we did have sex it wasn't like passionate or whatever. Like, I don't even remember it that much, but I know that there were points where we would talk through it and we would do the pillow talking thing. And he opened up to me like way more than I thought that he would. Um, Then we showered together the next day. I made a breakfast while he sat on the couch, motherfucker. And I dropped him home and I never saw him again. 
I barely ever heard from him again. Um, I think that he may have muted my stories so he didn't have to watch them anymore because he stopped watching all of my stories. And I know that's not like, that might, that might sound like crazy, but you know, when you click your stories, you see the people who watch them the most and he was one of them because he was always in my fucking DMs. And then suddenly he wasn't there at all. Mm. And I think that he might have felt that I was trying to push the encounter into something more consistent and instead of communicating because I said that when he was here and he didn't say anything else but instead of communicating that he was like he had fun but he didn't think that he wanted it to be consistent he just kind of disappeared so you said that you wanted it to be consistent I said that I was looking for um I wasn't looking for a serious relationship or relationship really as far as terms go I just wanted to date people and have fun Mm -hmm. um and you know whatever happens happens like I don't I didn't I don't want to be in a serious relationship though like that is an absolute no-no um but I didn't want it to be like a one-night stand kind of thing so Mm -hmm. I did communicate that um but he still done my shit he ghosted me and even though we only had sex one time I was heartbroken Mm -hmm. and I felt like you know you you could feel how you feel but I didn't feel like it was worth being heartbroken because I didn't really know him like that. And we just had like a moment that was fun, but it wasn't like this incredible love scene that happened. And that's when my friend introduced that theory. Like, do you think that you just might be addicted to fucking romance? Cause you are wowing right now. Cause you do this way too much. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I mean. Can I interject? Yeah. I think... Hmm. Well, I don't know the extent of your heartbrokenness, so maybe, like, let me preface with that, but, like, I've been very upset at people for less. Like, I've been upset at people who I thought that I was bonding with who I never even met Mm -hmm. and, like, upset for, like, at least a month about it. Like, oh, I've been talking to you for two weeks. I'm upset for a month. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, like, what makes me upset about those instances is, like, being disappointed at the uh, possibility of it all Mm -hmm. and, like, the... I'm having funness being cut yeah. short. And it's like, but there was still time to continue having fun. Yeah. So I don't know. On that level, that makes me feel like I don't think that that's a, I don't think that's a abnormal behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, just judging for myself, because I don't think that I have a love or romance addiction, but maybe the level of heartbreak. And then also, um, what was it? Uh, the, the fact that it happens often yes might be the the qualifying yes. thing there but fuck it, niggas it who ghost the, though yeah that was so stupid that's like and really honestly i don't think that like at this point like i'm giving that as an example um and that was maybe him confusing it on his end but you know you can confuse it on your end as well I'm not saying that that's what you did but you can confuse something very short and brief as oh this might be the one mm-hmm and that nigga doesn't even know your fucking name kind of thing. And, you know, that shit do happen. Um, but That's funny. the thing is, the actual addiction of it almost always stems from trauma. Mm. So that's being neglected or abandoned, sexual abuse, including, like, covert incest, as well as other traumas from early life. So I think it's really the culmination of all of these things that gives it the addictive behavior, not just the one or two things, because everybody can identify with some level of this, but I don't know many people who can identify with every facet of this. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me scroll. I actually have the mic right on the scroll key. It's very, very silly of me. It's an interesting place to place that. (laughs) Well, my my laptop isn't that big, but if I put it on the bed, it's going to move too much. My bed is really soft. Mm-hmm. And don't judge me, Sam. God damn. I wasn't judging you. Nah, get well, out of here. Maybe for one second. Yeah, 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 we was. It I was a little it. bit of judgment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So take the it back. The fuck puts that there? It made sense. <laughs> um, so for a serious love or romantic addiction, of course, you know, it can be treated like any other addiction. So that's inpatient, outpatient, or step programs. Another way for those of us who identify with a lot of these factors is we can change the way we think. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And I know changing the way you think, like it literally sounds so much easier in theory than in practice, but it always takes work to change something that you actually want to change. You got to want to change it and then you can change it. You can do whatever you want. And that's true. Yeah. Um, for most of us, when we have sex with someone that we like, we form an adult attachment bond. And it's similar to the ones that we had as an infant with our parents. So that's like the kissing and the cooing, the rocking, the holding, and the things that made us feel safe as like little nigglets. Um, so like, what about white people? Wigglets? Okay. You're telling me, bro. That's so funny. I feel like I shouldn't like laugh as hard as I do to the things you say, but that's so funny. Ah. I'm crying. <laughs> Sorry. so little nicklets or wigglets um (laughs) the more you have sex with this partner you may begin to feel like a separation anxiety even if you are the cause of the separation um like if you have to go to work or you have to go to way go away you are the person who is actually causing the separation but you still feel that extreme separation anxiety um and when the attachment is broken like you break up um you feel grief similar to losing a loved one even if you had no intention on actually dating this person for real mm. and you know that as, as i said it's a culmination because that does happen like mm-hmm. when you didn't really have an intention like you you didn't even like the person sometimes but just the fact that you know it it happened, you had sex, and you did have this attachment. It's not on no whole type shit. Like, yeah, we know when you have sex, you know, you transform. Soul ties. Yeah. But seriously, you do, like, it's not every t- time you have sex, and it's not with everybody that you have sex with, but with certain people that you do have sex with, especially when you have sex and you stay the night or you cuddle afterwards, you begin to form an, a, an attachment bond. Mm. And, and the separation anxiety, I think it could just be simple as really missing somebody. Mm. And it's like, what are you even missing? Because you don't really know this person like that. So or they're like, not a great person, do you? Yes. Or in general. But you, but you still miss them for no fucking reason. Mm. So when you when you break that bond, either they ghost you or you decide that you don't want to deal with them anymore or whatever, you feel this like grief like you someone that you love died. Mm. that's extreme mm-hmm. um so i would say if you find a partner just for like experiments because we don't really know what the fuck is going on so if you do find a partner that you think shit might be lit with um see what happens past the limerent stage see what happens when all of the drugs start to fade away and are you bothered by this person? Does this person make you feel uncomfortable? Does this person hurt you? And you see if you can, like, if this person isn't, if you don't feel those things, you feel kind of good. Um, you have to see through your own idealism of perfection of what a perfect relationship is supposed to look like because there is no perfect relationship and you go through the power struggles of a relationship because that it just happens there's you don't really dive into a relationship and everything is just picture perfect you you struggle with i don't like when you eat all the fucking yogurt because you don't even buy the fucking yogurt you never buy the yogurt shit like that you know (laughs) That has literally been a conversation. Like, this nigga's eating my fucking yogurt. He never buys the fucking yogurt. <laughs> but you want to buy other shit that I don't, like, whatever. Um, How inconsiderate. Yeah, niggas be wild. But, you know, you have to see if that is a boundary for you. If that's a red flag for you. And then, you you know, you just work on it. If it's worth it, it's worth it. If it's not, it's not. Um, and you have to see yourself objectively from the outside looking in and taking responsibility for your own emotional baggage because if you do feel like a lot of these things apply to you you know that you got some emotional fucking baggage Mm -hmm. but you have to take responsibility and not put oh i'm like this because of this so let me continue to be this exactly things that happen to you 
they might create the persona that you have, but they are not who you are. They're not all you are. You are a person separate from your experiences. So you can control how you react to situations if you want to. Hashtag you are not your trauma. Oh, yes, bitch. Um, you have to see yourself objectively and communicate in truthful and honest ways and maintain a level of respect inside the relationship on both mm. ends. Mm-hmm. Just because you're used to people, you know, being extremely disrespectful to you, abusive to you, doesn't mean that you up the ante. Mm. And it's like you are, uh, was it proactive instead mm-hmm. of reactive? It's like, I'm going to wild on you. So you don't even get the, you don't even get the chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you got to maintain a good amount of respect and in time you may become more flexible and accepting who you are and you and your partner's limitations and even if it doesn't work out it's more of a lesson than just the grief that you're that you're constantly experiencing you learned okay this is what i like this is what i don't like and i think i can leave this relationship without falling apart mm. which is like a good feeling to like cut some nigga off and be like bye yeah instead of like wondering i wonder what you're doing i wonder how you're doing like i wonder if he thinks about me because that's the thoughts that be running through niggas heads mm. the niggas who what is that uh taking up real estate in your head <laughs> yeah the niggas who are not paying <laughs> they, don't, they don't give a fuck um so more time more scientifically speaking self-expansion may help with these addictive behaviors So any novelty activity that activates the dopamine system and facilitates energy and optimism is creating a safe replacement reward. Mm -hmm. Um, Damn, if I can, this just popped into my head. In psychology, it's a it's a thing that 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 happens, and I forgot the word for it. Um, What's the explanation of it? The explanation of it is like somebody who likes to do something that is considered morally wrong so they replace it with doing something that it's the same thing but it's acceptable so somebody who likes to who's very interested in dismembering people becomes a surgeon Uh somebody who's very interested like too interested in dead bodies becomes like a mortician or the people who be doing autopsies and shit Mm -hmm. um it's the it's the Dexter theory, but not because he was actually killing people. Have you ever watched Dexter? I did. Oh, he, because uh, he likes to kill people. Like he like he's a fucking serial killer, but he, he justifies it to people killing. who are morally he feels deserves it. Yeah, exactly. But yes. that's still bullshit. But great exactly because mm. you out here killing niggas and shit still. Yes. Uh, um. So it's similar to that, except to the less extreme area. <laughs> Um, not morally reprehensible things but things that are harmful to you yes. um <laughs> but like the thing about those is that they get the same rush that they would feel if they were to be doing it mm-hmm. morally and the self-expansion would be to do an activity that would give you that same feeling but it's a positive activity right so this is more like rewiring the brain sphere, uh, the brain system. Nice. So your brain is plastic. And by that means, I mean, it can form new connections all the time. So like a person who loses their dominant hand, say their right hand, they lose it, it gets chopped off and they can't put it back. They can't use it. Through physical therapy, they can form new connections in their brain and they can make their only hand, their left hand, the dominant one. And they can use it just like the one that they lost. You see that a lot with people who are born without arms and then they use their legs and feet like Mm -hmm. arms and hands. A person who goes blind, but eventually the neural connections change that sound helps them see. Mm -hmm. Because initially when you go blind, it's not like automatic. Like Mm -hmm. you don't suddenly go, oh, I I know exactly where that is. I know exactly where that is. Your brain forms connections, but it's practice. Right. You know, it doesn't just happen. You you have to practice it. And then, like, the, the brain doesn't... It's a long pause. The brain doesn't stop changing unless you let it stop changing. Mm-hmm. You can always form new neural connections. No, you can't get more neurons, but you can form new connections. And we love neural connections. It's amazing. Um, it really is, like... 
I remember this story and I put it in here, like a person, he was born with half a brain, but he was able to, to create enough neural connections that he just functioned like a normal nigga in society. I think he had half a fucking brain though. And it's like, in theory, he's supposed to like not be able to function in certain areas because he's missing certain parts of the brain because different hemispheres do different shit. And they also control different parts of the body. So if he was missing his left side, he shouldn't be able to use his fucking right side, but he was able to be a normal ass nigga. So that means that anything is possible. Um, so if love and romance are collected to the reward systems, did I say collected? <laughs> if love and romance are connected to the reward systems in your brain, you have to create new neural connections to these reward systems to re-navigate how dopamine is released inside of your body. So some people try to stop dating entirely, going cold turkey, but without using the neuroplasticity, the behaviors are still there and relapsing is highly likely. Mm. Just like with stopping when you quit smoking cigarettes. Uh, you quit cold turkey, but you do nothing else. Some people can, I did, I was able to quit cold turkey. But a lot of, most people relapse because there was no behavior or no substitute. I think that was the name of that theory, like a substitution theory, something like that. But there was no substitute for smoking. Mm -hmm. So they just went back to smoking. Mm. Um, so my own personal theory, because, you know, I still got a degree in uh, human biology and psychology and all that. Um, but this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time and I've been practicing and it feels like it does, it does work a little mm -hmm. bit like, you know, but it takes time. So my own personal theory is to do this with songs. So my ex and I, we used to make playlists for each other. We were doing that from during our limerent stage. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of the songs in the playlist triggered a lot of emotions that I did not want to feel. Um, instead I combined both of our playlists, like all of our playlists, I renamed it to just love songs. Um, I used to have, we used to have pictures of each other on, as a playlist. I just put a picture of a really pretty flower <laughs> and, um, I listen to it when I'm doing anything like romantic or sexy to me. So if that's just like dancing, like in my room because I like to see myself looking all cute and shit. Mm -hmm. if I'm doing something with my for my OnlyFans. That's the playlist that I have in the background. Um, or if I'm doing anything sex work related, sex worker related in real life, I'll have that playlist playing. Or if I'm just like cooking or cleaning or just forming the connection past my ex mm. to something just doing things that I enjoy mm -hmm. and that helped me disassociate him from songs yeah. so I'm not as triggered if a song comes on I'm not like oh wow my ex sent that song to me oh my god like it's just a song you're like oh I twerk to that on OnlyFans and yes and and they Two love hours. that and they tap me bitch yes it's a good neural uh was it neural connection to me yes it nice. is a good, but it's a connection that you have to like force actively do. Yes, you can't. You can't expect it to happen. It's something that you really have to put work into do. Um, so also like activities that you did with a partner that when you think about, you always associate with them. Um, try it with a group of friends that you truly love and form a new memory to that activity that involves healthy love. Hmm. um deleting numbers especially as we are truly like truly in the era of not remembering people's phone numbers uh because now you really don't have to it helps curve the cue of seeing their name mm. so now you don't have a trigger on your phone constantly mm. and these are similar to the things that um rebecca spoke about in uh her breakup episode that was uh breakups why they suck and how to cope according to science i'll put that in the show notes for this episode along with the limerence episode yes yes mad other episodes that help with this episode um also slowly deleting pictures i have a lot of pictures with a lot of niggas 
a lot of pictures with a lot of niggas. Oh man, that's actually a good. Uh, that's a good episode title. It won't be it, but that's a. That's <laughs> it would good be though. Around. That would be a lot of pictures with a lot of niggas. But I do. I take pictures with people that I'm dating, or that I just had sex with, because I really like taking pictures. Um, I'll even do it with my my professional camera. Um, that last nigga who ghosted me, the last texts that we exchanged were just me sending him the pictures that I took of him because they were really fucking nice. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, fuck this nigga, but let me send him this artwork because I'm just going to delete it and it'll be lost forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then moving gifts, like things that... Uh, Can you start that, that again? Um, removing gifts from your place of residence or your workplace that um, somebody, somebody that you don't want to think about is giving you, um, doing activities that you used to reserve for a lover. Um, and you do that with loved ones who are not romantic. So back to the same nigga. Yo, fuck that nigga. That nigga's name is Mike. Fuck Mike. All right. But it's easier to say Mike. Um, I was supposed to bake a pizza with Mike. That was the next thing we were supposed to do. We planned on baking a pizza together. He worked in a pizza shop. I had some gluten-free pizza dough. And I'm like, I really want to bake this fucking pizza. Because I, I tend to only cook when I'm with somebody. I don't tend to cook alone, eat, make out until I'm poor. And it's very bad. Um, <laughs> but I instead... I have a friend that I see all the time and when they come over, I bake a pizza. And I began baking pizzas from scratch and these shits are quite fucking hitting. And it was like, why am I, I created a connection simply to pizza to another nigga that fast in a week because neurons, like neuroplasticity is fast if you put effort into it. I put effort into seeing it, seeing him again and making a pizza. So any thought about pizza, I thought about him. Mm. So now when I think about pizza, I think about when am I going to see one of my friends so I can fucking make these niggas a pizza mm. and, <laughs> and prove to them that I am a true Italian. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make you a pizza. Don't worry. You're going to understand. Um, <laughs> but it all truly helps form new connections in your brain associated less with romance. And you still get the dopamine rush you love, but in a safer way. It minimizes the rejection fallout that causes the compulsive behaviors because not only are you providing yourself a distraction, you're re- rewiring yourself to be less addicted and more in control. Mm-hmm. And remember, it's truly a process. It doesn't happen overnight. You may relapse a couple times before you get it right. It may take months. It may take years to truly feel free of the compulsion to be with someone, but be patient with yourself. Nice. And that's about it. How did you feel putting all that together? Um, I was very intrigued because I'm like, wow, this is really like, think about it. I think we spoke about this one day after recording and we couldn't really pinpoint a time where I was actually like single, single. Mm -hmm. I've always been either in a serious relationship or dealing with somebody. Yeah. In a compact, in a uh, compact, what is the word? Uh, Whatever, forgot the word. No, in a well, in a way that it could have ended up being a relationship okay. or not. I thought it could have been, and they didn't think so, or whatever. I've been like that since I was about 19 years old. Mm-hmm. I've always been involved with somebody. So, like, really seeing that, I mean, I already had an idea of doing all of these things because. You know, I know neuroplasticity really does help, but it helped me become patient with myself and like really understand like, okay, like I do have wild childhood trauma. I have a lot of rejection trauma from childhood. So I can see why I can try to keep somebody in that limerent stage forever, but it's not, it's not okay. It's not safe to keep trying to do that. And it's also just not possible. It's right. an unrealistic expectation that you have. Yeah. Me and my ex who just broke up, we had this crazy limerent stage. It was absolutely beautiful. It faded away. And I would never apologize to this nigga because fuck this nigga. He's a horrible person. But 
I did try to prolong the stage for as long as I could. And I was always like, oh, but she used to do this. You used to do that. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? But it's because we were past that dopamine rush and everything was just normal. Mm. But we could never get back to normal. So once I really realized that that shit was a true dub, I finally was like, all right, let's just end it. And then I jumped right into something else and then jumped into something else and then jumped into something else. It's only been like three months, two months. I don't even know what is time, but just I'm just going to be more patient. And That's then, good. I'm glad uh, doing this episode allowed you to be more gentle with yourself. Uh, I do want to say, and this is like something for a different episode, but I do want to say that there's like space for a conversation where it's like, just because you're out of the limerence stage doesn't mean that uh, the two people in the relationship should stop trying to do sweet things for each other. And I think that's something that people might, uh, like there's kind of like a tangled territory here where it's like one person might not be doing that because they don't feel it anymore. But Mm -hmm. if you plan to be in a long-term relationship with someone, then that is actually a behavior that should remain consistent. So that's what's evaluating. In the limerent stage, you kind of develop expectations. Yeah. So like something as simple as every once in a while, like every week or two weeks, you post a picture of your loved one in your story, mm-hmm. randomly a picture that they sent you, a picture that you really liked. Um, and then suddenly you stop posting pictures completely. And mm-hmm. it almost seems as if you two weren't together. And it's like, okay, well, you don't see an issue with that, but I do because that's an expectation that you set in the beginning. So is it that it's just something that you did in the limerent stage and it's something that you don't want to do anymore? Or is it that you just don't want to do this and you haven't uh, had the balls to just end it? You just want right. to prolong the relationship. So I do completely agree with that. You got to do nice shit. Just because you fucking with somebody for a long time doesn't mean you just be with them. <laughs> like, the fuck? That's it's my me. partner. <laughs> just add on that. That's on period love. Well, thank you very much for that, Rob. I love the I love when we get all sciencey on this podcast. Uh, if anybody has any responses to what Rob said, or if you just discovered that you might have a romance addiction that you need to talk with a mental professional about, because we are not diagnosing you. On no, this no, 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 no. Um, tell us about your experiences and things like that, because that would be a really interesting conversation yes. to continue. Also. If you have uh, ideas for episodes that are rooted in science or deep dives or anything like that, uh, we're kind of trying to play with the um, format of the show. So definitely tell us what you what is pressing, what you want to hear the hoes talk about. Uh, we're going to move on now to our segment called Fuck Me, which is our segment about our sexual, romantic, and dating lives. And within that segment is a mini segment called Sam Presents ass media which is a play on the term mass media i like how you extremely emphasize ass like you kind of yelled it yeah i love it thank you i love you (laughs) i love you too uh i'm taking a break from sharing about my personal life which is typically what this segment is for while i deal with some things on my end but in the interim i'm not going to stop talking because this is a podcast and maybe you gotta host it so uh instead i'll be giving book tv podcast film all things media reviews that relate to sex love dating and or gender and most of the time they're spoiler free reviews so this week the review is on a movie called the half of it have you ever heard of it i have not So this movie is on Netflix. It debuted uh, maybe like two or three weeks ago. And I saw a little bit about it and then it kind of just petered out. So I think it's a good movie for people to watch. So I definitely want to like boost it on this podcast. So the synopsis that they give on Google and maybe even Netflix itself is a shy introverted student helps the school jock woo a girl whom secretly they both want. So I put this on, uh, it was one of the... uh, options for our Netflix watch parties for patrons to vote on and nobody voted on it and I think it's because the synopsis doesn't do it justice but the synopsis is trying to do what the movie itself did so now I'm going to give you my own synopsis which is uh, what, what did I say here 
Oh, yeah, it sounds like a typically oppressive, heteronormative, toxic, romantic love story that nobody wants to watch anymore because the heyday for those are over. Mm -hmm. So here's my synopsis. Uh, The story revolves around a 17-year-old Chinese-American friendless writer who lives in a very white American town and is queer but not out. Her white male classmate and her fall for the same Latina queen bee of the school and all the people involved learn and grow along the way about themselves. So I think it was a really, really well done film. Um, And yeah, I would suggest, I would actually suggest that everyone watches it. I'm still up to doing a Netflix party on it. Uh, One thing I really enjoyed was the opening montage. Uh, I won't spoil too much, but the, I mean, it's the first thing that happens in the film. Uh, It's an artistic, I think it's like stop motion animation. Uh, that is happening while the main character is narrating and they're narrating the uh, myth of soulmates and that the the Greek or maybe it's Roman myth of soulmates is that people were together as two people in one body or in one soul and then when they came down to earth they got separated and you need to find your other half to be whole and then at the end because the main character is a writer they're like yeah but that's all bullshit anyway and a different kind of film could have took it and been like oh yeah it's not actually bullshit I found my soulmate but that's like not what this movie is about at all and that's so good that that kind of media (laughs) is being made because all of the early 2000s were like these same rom-coms and they're not healthy. <laughs> they're not healthy depictions of like romantic love, but even more so self-love. So uh, the film claims that it's not a love story and it holds to that. And it has strong messages about self-actualization, self-growth and self-love and love in general, which I think you need self-love in order to feel love with other people. Maybe that's not true. Yeah. Uh, I think it enhances debatable. it. I think it enhances it. Yeah, it it can do that because you value yourself more if you have self love. Exactly. So, like for example, like if you love yourself, you're willing to put up boundaries with the people that you love, which is better for the relationship with yourself, themselves, and the two of you. So, yeah. Agree. Uh, there are many moments where the film subverts typical rom coms. So you know, like every film has the fucking makeover scene or whatever, and it's like, oh. oh, this is the nerdy girl, and here's the montage or whatever. They didn't even do the montage, which I was like, oh, nice. They didn't even do the montage. And then in the regular movie, it'd be like they take their fucking glasses off and put on a tight dress, and it's like, oh wow, va va voom or whatever. <laughs> Um, this main character is like they dress like kind of masculine or whatever, so. They do the makeover before the big event. I won't say what the big event is or, or whatever. Um, and then they, it, it uh, cuts to the scene where they're at the big event and they're still dressed masculine presenting. And it's not like they took their fucking, like their glasses are still on. They didn't like take their hair down or anything like that. And it's not like, oh, here I am in a fucking, in a party dress for no fucking reason. They just like became that- a sexy masked person. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't even like they didn't become sexy. Like they're still a 17 year old kid who just like put some effort into their, their, their presentation. And like, that's what actual life is like. Yeah, true. So, uh, they also do it. There's like a running scene, like, you know, in rom-coms where it's like, wait, don't go like that kind of thing. And they run after it. I won't say why that happens, but it's subverted. It's, in this it's film, not the I same. Think. They do it in a really cute way. Yeah. Aww. Uh, the pacing was really well done. Something that's been bothering me lately because I've just been watching a lot of movies in uh, core core quarantine. Um, <laughs> movies be way too fucking long and shows be way too fucking long. And I'm like, you could have just like easily cut a good 20, 30 minutes. Like, what were we doing here? But this went by. It didn't feel too long. And it also didn't feel rushed. So that was really well done. A um, couple of other things some films and this might be like a personal choice thing it doesn't bother me in films but it's like oh you kind of like you shot yourself in the leg with that it's some people know it as like a a trope that specifically happens in marvel movies so like a serious moment will happen in a film and then they just be like oh well i just farted like that's not a good thing but it's just (laughs) like it, it cuts the serious moment with something funny instead of letting the serious moment sit and the audience like actually feel those emotions and this film could have done that like there were parts where i'm like are they gonna undercut this with some bullshit and they didn't it's funny but it lets the serious moments hang and i really appreciate that and then last but not least the writer and director alice Wu is a gay asian woman and she's just fucking putting her story on netflix and we love to fucking see it we do yeah and it was just a good movie uh, a good little hour and a half watch yeah 
One to ten. One to ten. Scale of one to ten? Mm-hmm. I didn't have any flaws with that. You give it a ten. Wow. Yeah. I didn't have any flaws with it. Okay. There were some things where I'm like, does it always have to be that way? And then it was like, not that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Good movie. He, I, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch it because I've been Netflixing myself to death. I think it's also, uh, I can't say this because I didn't really feel this way growing up, but like for people, for women who are attracted to women who just felt unrequited love and like a space where they can't even like have that typical, I'm a teen and I'm living out my teen crush dramas. Like I feel very silenced about it. I think that Mm -hmm. people can see themselves in that character, Alice. And then people who grew up in oppressively white spaces I think they can also see their experience also. I'm here for it. Yahweh. Thank you so much, Allison Wu. It's Alice. Wow. Thank you so much, Alice Wu. You're just dissing her. OD, my fault. Thanks, Alicia Wu. <laughs> Angelica Wu. Um <laughs> what's going on in uh what's going on in your hood? So my weekly, well not weekly, my episodically mm-hmm. occurring segment is sex and antidepressants because i am a highly sexual being who is on antidepressants anti-anxiety pills and sleep medication and a known side effect of these drugs especially antidepressants are decreased libido so in this segment i document my journey with balancing my sex drive and my medication so i know i wrote some notes but i had an epiphany last night okay at 1.48 in the morning after I came back from a run, okay, um, a run like at the firehouse, um, I don't know where it came from, but it happened. And I said, Do, does everybody go through stages of horniness and not horniness? Yeah. So what if I was hypersexual and my medication and my therapy helped me be less hypersexual. It's a possibility. And now what I feel is really just um, what everybody else feels, but I feel um, anxiety because I've never felt it before. Mm. So I'm like, what if I'm just average? I also think there's like no average. Yeah. Like but people I, experience like, sexual uh sexual libido differently. Yes. But I just don't I don't think that I mean it could be a side effect, but I don't think that it's like it just doesn't I I felt it as like this negative thing. I've honestly like G shit, like I've been viewing it as a negative thing. Like, oh, I can't orgasm. I'm I'm only horny sometimes. I haven't masturbated in this long, but it it does vary. But for me, literally for my almost entire sexual um, sexual age or whatever, well, I started having sex at, like, really having sex at 16. And since then, I've always felt, ne- always felt horny. Always. It never stopped. I had to, like, form a bond with God one time to be um abstinent until marriage that lasted all of two months and (laughs) but I had that was me like going to church like trying to pray the sex out of me um but I was but it was it didn't like change the core of me like I was just extremely hypersexual person Mm -hmm. um so with going to therapy and talking about things that have happened to me being more open with my friends and talking to them about the things, like being very honest with them. Um, and of course, medication, but I just feel like it's not just the medication playing a factor on my libido. I think a lot of it also has to deal with me actually healing from sexual trauma mm-hmm. and, and that turning me to be less focused on sex mm. and to be focused on other things especially like I focus a lot more on healing I focus Mm -hmm. a lot more on really trying to force myself to 
leave people who hurt me alone, trying to convince myself that I am worthy of friendships that do not cause me pain, Mm -hmm. any kind of pain, even if it's pain that they don't mean to give me. If I perceive it as pain, then it is pain and I shouldn't have to deal with that. Um, So that's just something that really came to my mind. Like, I think it was one of those things where like one time I didn't know, cause I don't, I don't have like a lot of um, feminine body friends. I do now have a lot more, but when I was like early twenties, I didn't. Um, I had like three and I didn't know if it was normal, even though this was stupid, but still, I didn't know if it was normal to not be able to see your vagina from when, while looking down. Like, I know that sounds like, it might sound kind of weird, but it's just, <laughs> just something, something I've never thought about before. <laughs> well, I think it was just because I began gaining weight mm-hmm. because I was just going through, like, I went through a, a very late stage puberty. Like I really bloomed, bloomed at like 21. Mm-hmm. Like I started to actually like get like bigger and get hips. Like I look like what a woman looks like or whatever. Um, but I could no longer see my vagina. And I, I remember I was always used to look down and go, oh, it's coochie. And I couldn't see it anymore. And I didn't know if that was an experience that everybody else shared. Mm-hmm. And then when I began to ask, they were like, yeah, no, I mean, some people can, but most people can't see their vaginas. When they mm-hmm. look down. They have to like push their stomachs back or something. And I felt like it was like that. Like I actually had to begin, like I had to ask somebody like, you have sex, but do you always want to have sex? Do you always want to masturbate? Like, is this like a thing that you turn on and off or is it just a thing that's always on? And he's like, no, it's just, it's like, it comes and goes. I feel how I feel. And I just didn't know that people, like, I don't know. I just didn't know that I could feel how I feel. Mm. Like I have sex. And then after I have sex for like another week and a half, I just don't, want to have sex Mm -hmm. and I thought that was so crazy like why don't I want to have sex why do I just want to sit and cuddle with this person why am I crying because I'm not horny what the fuck like it was that bad Mm -hmm. but now I'm realizing that I it's okay to not be horny like it truly is okay drugs are not but one thing that the antidepressants are doing I have my dose um raised Mm -hmm. because I began I am still currently dissociating a lot it is very unsafe so i had my dosages increased increased <laughs> <laughs> increase um by two so if i was on 50 i'm on 100 or something like that um but i did notice that before you know i was if i did have sex i began having orgasms like regularly but now again i don't have orgasms mm. but the sex still feels good and i still want to have it when i when I want to have it but I just don't be coming Mm. and I'm like I'll come eventually like on my own came like four days later and shit but um an increase in dose can affect your sexual energy even if you felt like you had it figured out so I feel like probably in a month or two when my body's used to the dose then it will go back to how it was unless Mm -hmm. it gets raised again or whatever, or unless my medication change changes, it just, it's just a, it's a process, but I wouldn't, I would definitely say um, lack of libido because when my old psychiatrist is like, Oh, you can't have an orgasm. All right. Well, let's see what other medications you could take. I would say (laughs) she was really serious. So I really thought orgasm advocate. (laughs) She was with the shit. She's like, oh, when you masturbate, you can't come? And I'm like, girl, I don't even want to masturbate. I don't even want to touch myself. And she's like, oh, we got to get you on some other medication. We'll chat. We'll see what happens in a month. We'll see what happens in two months. That was the funniest thing ever. But I would definitely say that if you are on medication, thinking about medication or starting another medication, anything with medication and mental illness, um, to just really give the shit a chance and also explore your feelings outside of 
sex mm-hmm. um, and see what happens. Because I was just focused on, oh, I'm on these drugs. Now I can't come. But now I'm exploring all these feelings surrounding sex and knowing that the drugs definitely probably had an effect on it, but it's also opening up a new world of healing. And I, I don't know, I kind of like it now. It's fucking dope. I think, um, I think that was the series finale of this segment. <laughs> like, I feel like you, you kind of, you made I a big breakthrough there. there. Yeah. Told you the 200th episode thing, like, <laughs> girl, like, listening to the, the fuck me's, I haven't, because I just can't. I know it's going to be cringy, but I know that listening to fuck me's from a year ago, we should probably do that. See, see how much you've grown. Okay, (laughs) that's fun. That that might be fun. (laughs) But you know, I I know from even beginning this segment, my outlook on sex, and I I admitted it. It was like a I had a negative um, relationship with sex, but now it's becoming more of like my nigga. A, it's not that serious. Like, (laughs) it's not that serious. It's never that serious. It shouldn't be serious enough to cause you sadness. I mean, it, it depends on who you are, but for me, it shouldn't have been serious enough to cause me sadness because there's so much trauma I have with sex. Like, niggas gotta fucking heal from the trauma. You can't heal from the trauma while still... Um, I keep forgetting words, but by still acting like out traumatic. Yeah. Well, that's still being in the... Putting yourself in those traumatic situations. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like if you and sex and rejection are the things that hold you back, you feel like those hold you back, but you keep having sex with people that reject you, then how can you really heal? Good point. That's like literally smoking cigarettes, saying that I'm going to quit cigarettes and all you do is smoke cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Doesn't make a lot of sense. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long ass episode, so I'm done, son. Wow. That's really cool. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. Now I'm curious about uh, kind of just want to do a, a deep dive into how horny people are and when. Because yeah. this whole time, I mean, you've been saying this and you do say that you're hypersexual, but I didn't know that you were like horny all the time. I I used to, girl. Like, I don't know like why I would I know? <laughs> like, yeah, how would you know, right? Maybe I just text you every time I'm horny. But I used to have like a lot of like flashbacks like when i'm in things that i you know i need to be focused on i'm thinking about fucking sex or i'm just constantly trying to find a like constantly trying to find a sexual partner and i don't think that being hypersexual is necessarily like the worst thing or a bad thing i think it it depends on how you feel about it my hypersexuality can put me sometimes in unsafe situations or it can put me with just really mean people for the sake of just being with a person Mm -hmm. so you know i do want to know though like how horny and how often are niggas really horny so we can have a scale but i'm sure there's probably like a study like that like that just measures sexual like sexual feelings i'm gonna find it i'm gonna make an instagram poll (laughs) You're oh, gonna do that very scientific thing, and I'm just gonna be like, "How horny do you be?" I like, I like yours. With We're the, just gonna do yours with the little sliding scale thing and the little yeah, I'm horny emoji. You know that one, the orange one. <laughs> wait, wait, which how one? horny do you be? It's like a little orange face, like the I'm mad face, but it's orange and like their tongue is out. It's like, <laughs> oh, I, that's I'm, the horny face. I'm parched. Maybe we send that a thirsty one face. Horny. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. What it is. I gotta start sending that. Just kidding, because these niggas are trash. <laughs> obviously oh boy yeah okay yeah definitely <laughs> right into us how horny are you <laughs> i'm so fucking horny <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's probably gonna increase with the fucking social distance thing yeah right. well let's get into our next segment it is called fuck you it is the last segment of the episode and it is about your sexual romantic and dating lives if you would like to ask us for some advice share your hotels or rant against the white cis het patriarchy you can send your thoughts to ihu podcast at gmail.com please include your pronouns and because we are in the future you can also leave us a voicemail we will play it and respond to it on the show to do that you can call us at 404-491-9158 again that's 404-491-9158 
888-999-9158. That number will be in the show notes. And also I don't answer the phone when you call. It goes straight to voicemail. So if you're phone shy, no worries. All right. So this letter is from Yaya. I'm unsure of Yaya's pronouns, uh, but the subject line is a response to how, uh, oh, sorry. The subject line is a well, the subject is a response to when we ask how are folks virtually dating a few weeks ago. So Yaya writes, my partner and I actually live together, but they had to drive home for a family emergency. So we went from having a lot of support and instantaneous at that to now both assisting chronically sick relatives and all the anxieties and emotions of the Rona. Uh, I mentioned chronic illnesses because none of the illnesses slash emergency is actually COVID-19 related, but impacted nonetheless, of course. Of course, yeah. Uh, I hope everybody's doing okay. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, And our plethora of mental health issues alone. Wow, that was a long sentence, but it wasn't. (laughs) I don't know. I think it it kind of was, but that's fine. We are not. We'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take it. Not sticklers here. Uh, Anyway, it's been hella tough, I'm sure. We've tried to replicate nights on the couch by watching Netflix together separately. But my favorite thing to do so far is to read to my partner on FaceTime. I didn't realize how intimate the practice of reading Black feminist lit to my partner over video chat would be and how it make me feel closer to them than anything else god that's sweet as shit yeah man <laughs> uh, them falling asleep to the sound of my voice and us sharing sharing in stories of black love and resistance and being was more home than <laughs> i've had in a long time that should maybe want to cry a little bit uh sincerely yeah yeah 24 harlem 10 days without my partner 24 days in quarantine damn that's the cutest shit I ever fucking heard. Yeah, that is I've so never, ha- I've never had anybody read to me. Me, like not as an adult, no. Yeah, read to me. Well, I that's feel like sweet. it's time for um friends to start reading to friends because that shit sound cute as fuck. What, what do you want people to read to you, Rob? Um, I'd like to also be read some black feminist literature. I feel like it's a lot of it is so complex that when you're actually reading it, it's hard to visualize it as well. But if you hear it, it's like you, you take away that one stimuli of processing the words mm. and you get to really like soak it in, soak mm. it in, soak it in. So I would love somebody to read me some Alice Walker, like for real. Like it just too. sounds like so intimate. And maybe it's because I'm doing that thing that people tend to do, which is like, like give a little bit more um credibility to tv uh tv i love tv so fucking much <laughs> give a little bit more <laughs> give a little bit more credibility to books over tv as a medium where it's just like oh the page turning and getting intimate with it and things like that mm-hmm. um i don't know if my brain is doing that but no it's not i mean probably it still is because that's still ingrained in everybody but like when you're watching a television show with your partner or whoever you're watching a television show with the tv is doing it but when you're reading to someone like it's actually like you're actively like you're creating this yeah you're creating this entertainment that you're both uh, going through Mm -hmm. so that's right i don't know what i want read to me but i would like to read probably like horror to people and i know that that's very on brand and i'm always like oh let's watch this horror movie together but yeah i feel like i (laughs) I feel like i could be like very uh theatrical with it as opposed to just like I'm reading, I would do like the and all that kind of goofy shit. I would love it if you read to me, Sam. <laughs> oh, I'll read to you. Pick a book. I don't know any horror books, bitch. I don't know who I am. The what fuck? is a book? I literally never read. The only horror story I've ever read was Beloved by Toni Morrison. That was scary enough. Yeah, it was. <laughs> that shit still scared me. I was like, what the fuck? So you got to pick a book. All right, we'll figure it out. All right. We'll have our own date because we're dating each other. (laughs) Uh, If anybody at home or wherever you're listening does this, write into us or like let us know what you would like read to you. I'm just curious. This was so fucking cute. Yeah, yeah. Facts. That was man cute. And honestly, like I know y'all love my voice. So like I'll read to you. Would you do that on OnlyFans? I would. But I don't have that. Like my fans don't aren't a fan of my fucking voice. Tell you that much. Have we asked? 
Oh no, I just know. Okay. Oh, I know. I I. I <laughs> you gotta. This is so. I but just, however, <laughs> if you do, if because I have like it's my only fans are it's exclusively men. Uh-huh. Um and. I mean, I love them, but no, they just, I mean, I look good and they liked how I look, really. I got, I got a but really, so, oh, go ahead. If you have a really dumb thought, I have a silly No, thought. please say the dumb thought now. <laughs> Come on, get it out, get it out. All right, so like, obviously implying that you were like, they care about your body and not like what you're saying or whatever. And in my mind, it was like, make your ass cheeks clap Morse code to do the book. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, maybe that'll be hard. And then I, <laughs> my mind is so weird. It was like queef <laughs> in Morse code. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Anyway, what were you saying? <clears throat> it was like queef in Morse code. All right. I'll start okay. where it actually started. Um, it was like do sign language with your ass. And I was like, oh, that doesn't even make any sense. Yeah, no. And then it just devolved into nothing. Just okay. All right, Sam. Too far. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Exactly. I can't even make my ass clap. So let's just get that. That's out why I the said way. queef. Anyway. And that air in my coochie. Niggas shoving air in my coochie just to queef out more school. <laughs> and all it says is high. Billionaire, nigga. That's <laughs> one, one of those black <laughs> China shit. But, um, no, if, if you're listening, because I don't want my OnlyFans to just, like, exclusively be, like, fucking sex and sexual content. I would like to do, like, you know, other other non-sexual things, like post my workout videos. Ooh. I do, there's a guy who I send, like, topless workout videos to, but he just loves my muscles, so I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to post my workout videos, and y'all niggas tip me for it, but I would love to go on live and, yeah, read, talk. I just don't have like fans enough fans to actually go on live with me because I have been on live, but it would just be me staring at myself. That shit was not weird. So like, don't think of OnlyFans like just like the sexual platform. It's also kind of just like a Patreon for another for a person. It's literally Patreon. It's not. It's literally not only sexual content. Niggas have all kinds of shit on OnlyFans. And if you like me as a human, subscribe. That's a Finax. Rob's OnlyFans link will be in the description of this episode. And as we are winding down, I would just like to say if this episode made you laugh, help you learn something, made you feel good, made you question yourself in a good way, or positively moved you in any sense, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher and let everyone you know know that you love these hoes. We deeply, deeply appreciate all of you. If you would like to follow us on social media, you can do so by following us on Inner Whole Uprising without the G on Twitter, Inner Whole Uprising with the G on Instagram, and you can join our Facebook group by searching, oh wait, also Inner Whole Uprising with the G on Facebook, I forgot about that part. And uh, if you want to join join our Facebook community, you could do so by searching Inner Whole Uprising community, that's C U M. U N I T Y, and you could head to Inno, <laughs> you could head to InnoHoUprising.com to sign up for weekly goodies via our newsletter, pay a hoe, or check out merch. Yes, yes. How can people follow you? Um, you can follow me by going to Instagram. I'm at Pubiscus, P U B I S C U S, and I am. Who am I? On Twitter, that's a good question. I, just I thought you were the gal dem sugar. <laughs> that was <laughs> it. Was really good. That was really good. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I should just change it to that. I am Robbie V Body R O B B Y V with two E's Body. Oh, we got a Twitter change name. Yeah, I'm trying Twitter to escape change. niggas as a maximum effort. To just... I'm weak. <laughs> need to change their whole identity and shit. Whole uh, I'm Slam Rid on Instagram and Twitter, and Carmen Sam Diego on Instagram for travel and food photos. Peace out. Oh, and my OnlyFans is OnlyFans.com slash B B Y B O I R O B. Baby Boy Rob. Yes. Sick. See ya, niggas.